All right, I've synced my cameras. I've got two GoPro Hero 8s. And the one here that I'm pointing to with my thumb has been uh, a little bit light in the coloring or the, the exposure, really overexposed, really. And so what I did is I sat down and synced both cameras so that it matches uh, the color on both cameras so that uh, there's no big change from the color on this camera that I'm pointing to now and this camera that I'm pointing to now and so that uh, it's not confusing to people looking at my video why is it darker and then why is it lighter <laughs> time to play with some clay Anyway, I'm going to be working on uh, the base today. Uh, I got a good bid on uh, the uh, clay from the foundry. It only costs $300 more to do the uh, dog, which is a damn good bid. That's about what I thought it would be, but I just uh, really wanted to make sure that I knew for sure so I could set a, a, a price. It's just going to be... The selling price of this is going to be just under 10000 I know that's a lot of money, but you got to pay a gallery 50% or 40%, and you've got to pay for the casting and the mold out of your share. Now, the mold is a one-time cost, and that's okay. I can handle that. But that means uh, a good share of uh, what I make off the first sale is going to be sunk right back into the cost of reproducing or reproducing the uh, first copy and uh, so i have to adjust the price to and i come up with a formula that works for me and uh, everybody will have to do their own formula to work for them you don't want to I'll overprice a piece uh, you want to charge what the market will bear as far as uh, your work goes I'm still gonna make this so that I can take it off the base so I can work on the dog alone because I still got work to do on the legs and such but for now for the uh, gallery um, to show it in the gallery I'm just gonna go ahead and work on the base and cover up those uh, joints. I know where they are because I marked it on my board here where the uh, line for the uh, division is and uh, I'll do the same over here with a marker if I can find one. So I'm going to just uh, make two marks one for the main separation and one for the separation from the uh, base on this side where I put the extension of wood to fill in this right here. I'm going to have to cut some clay up pretty soon and uh, I'm running out of clay, but I've got, I think I've got enough to do this. And then I've got to work on the uh, warrior and the woman, uh, the uh, a warrior's farewell sculpture, uh, because uh, I'm going to take that down too. I just need to close up that space uh, which, that goes down where I separate her from the, uh, the base to work on her alone. Okay, these rocks are a few days old, and so they're a little stiffer than I like. 
I'm trying to put the rock texture I put into the big rock behind the warrior and underneath the warrior. And the best way to do that is by building up the uh, rocks again with some new clay. I'm using a uh, dishwashing brush. It's stiff and uh, it gives a nice rocky texture, you know, kind of like a granite or an old uh, rock texture. So and I'm not worried about getting the rocks perfectly smooth. I don't want them to be perfectly smooth. I want them to have imperfections in them. And uh... now I'm hitting this really hard with the uh the brush I'm pressing in on the clay to give it the dimples that I want or the roughness that I want this will also complement the type of patina I will put on the uh, bronze I'm going to be doing a terracotta or ru rust patina because I, I really like either traditional or terracotta more than I do color. I, I don't want to do a bunch of colors for the clothing. I think that's distracting. Although it works in some pieces and some pieces it doesn't. For instance, there's pause of the dog aren't done and the legs aren't done but they're done enough to show what the dog's going to look like next to the uh, figure now i'm just going to form some rocks and i'm not going to worry about shaping them just taking some of the uh All right, I've put some fringe, short fringe, on the outer edge of the shirt. And that's just to uh, break up that line of uh, the edge of the shirt. Fringe had a purpose to it, shed water in a rainstorm. I don't want to get too detailed on the fringe because if I do, then it's, uh, it will be hard to cast and will cost me more. The uh, shirts that they would make were very primitive. They didn't have sewn up seams on the side. They, they were like a poncho. They'd fit over their necks. And the arms would be simply leather that would... Uh, draped over the arm and then tied 
every so often down the, the arm to keep it on the arm like a sleeve. I used to make Native American clothing so I could understand it better. I used to make it out of chamois skin, the kind of leather you buy to polish your car up with, because that is about as close to brain, the feel of brain tanned leather as uh, you can get without buying brain tanned. Brain tan is very expensive. Very. Because it's a long, drawn out process. What they would do is they would take the brains of the animal and just to show you that every animal had just enough brain matter to tan its own hide. Now tell me there wasn't a design in that from a greater source. And it, it was something that had been done for hundreds of thousands of years. It wasn't something that was invented by the Native Americans. It was invented by Europeans as well. Just make, putting a break in the uh, fringe to make it look more real. Listic. To sort of break up that solid line. Okay, I'm just going to smooth out uh, the area back here. Well, this is going to be the last thing I do on this piece before I take it down Thursday. I'll work on uh, the warrior and his girlfriend tomorrow. Give me a thumbs up and share my video. And then check out my instructional DVDs, uh, the link down below this video. All right. See you next time.